Jesus, and it is you. We acknowledge that right now. You are a strong God, and uh, you are mighty. You are able. You are mighty to save. You are mighty to provide. You're mighty to protect. You're mighty to heal. You're mighty to deliver. You're mighty. All things that we need that the soul craves for are found in you, Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we, uh, we want to acknowledge right now that, that because you are strong, that we are not. We, 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 we submit ourselves and we bow before you right now. We can't call you a strong God unless we would be willing to bow before you right now. And as your word comes forth through Pastor Jay tonight, Lord, we pray that you would give us the ability to lower our will down and subject it to yours tonight, Lord. Please have your way. You said in your word that if we have the spirit in us, then let the spirit control every area of our life. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you afresh right now. We give our mind, we give our ears, we give our heart, we give our attention to you, Lord Jesus, because you are in this room right now. You are enthroned on the praises of your people. We have placed you where you rightly deserve to be tonight in our praises, on the throne. And so we bow before you and your throne right now in the name of Jesus. If you agree, what do you say? Amen. Have a seat. Pastor Jay, would you please come up here? As Jay's coming up here to, to bring God's word to you tonight, I just want to um, do something I don't normally do, and that is to honor another person other than Jesus. This is, this right here, this is, this belongs to Jesus Christ right here, and no one knows that more than the man coming up on the stage, but Amen. I want to just um, take a moment to acknowledge him because um, having done this now for about 15 years, there hasn't always been a time that I could take a week, a two weeks, a month, whatever, and just step away and not be worried sick about what's going to happen here at the church, if the preacher's going to show up, if, the, if crazy things are going to be happening that are, no, that are extra biblical, right? And so um, I have the joy now of having a week where I could defrag my brain and step down and let somebody else do this that I can trust, that I know, I trust, and I love. Thank you, brother. And so that's Thank who this you, man is. And so would you guys just take a second and just honor a man who's been doing this for a long time? He deserves it. I know he really didn't want me to do that, and that's all the more right. reason why we should be rejoicing that he's here. I want to pray uh, for him with you real quick, and then he's, I'm going to get out of the way and let this man who's been doing it a lot longer than me, a lot better, yeah. I'm sure, at yeah. most often, uh, get out of his way, let him do what he does. But Lord, we just thank you for this time tonight. We thank you that your spirit is here with us. We thank you for your precious and perfect and powerful word yes, that, yes, that you Lord. have given to this man. I thank you, Lord, that you've allowed him the opportunity to understand it. He has studied to show himself approved, a workman unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. Help him to do that tonight so that yes, your people can hear your voice not his. Give us yes, ears Lord. to hear what you have to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, you, brother. Lord. Love you. Love you too. He told me he was going to do that, and I told him, uh, don't make the pedestal too high because I don't want to fall that far. Before I get into the word, though, I want to share something with you that just came to me, and this is going to sound, I don't know. I had an opportunity to go to a funeral today. Our pastor preached it, and, and, and you know, it kind of sounds strange to say the opportunity to go to a funeral, but if you've been listening the last couple of days here, uh, if you know Dave Strickland and that family, his dad passed away at 92 years old, and he professed Jesus as his Savior four days, Moses, four days before God took him home. And at the service today, and I thought this was so neat, he had been a mailman for years, 30-some years, and his remains were in a mailbox, and it was to return to sender. I thought that was so cool. It's a, totally a miracle of God that a person that age would accept Jesus Christ. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we found out uh, yesterday that our son's first Sunday school teacher, uh, who taught him... He was between two and three years old. Went home to be with the Lord this week. She was 104. So good long life. God has blessed her. Uh, 
So we will be going to another funeral shortly. So it's a, it's a sad time, but also for those of us who are in Christ, it's a great time. It's a time of victory. It's a time of stepping from one place to a better place. So we want to just glorify God for saving those people. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. As always, I'd like to pray before we start. So if you'll go to the Lord in prayer with me, please. Father God, just thank you for the opportunity to be up here. Lord, years ago when I first surrendered to the call, I wondered what would happen if you would give me a word and no one would listen. But over the years, you, I, I believe you've given me words, Lord, and I know people have listened. And, and through your power and your grace and my stumbling, you have been lifted up. I pray that will happen tonight, Lord. I pray that self will be removed and your Holy Spirit will have total and complete dominance. I pray, Lord, that hearts will be changed and challenged and uplifted. And my most fer fervent prayer, Lord, is if there's anybody here tonight that doesn't know you as Savior, does not have that relationship with you, that, Lord, this would be the night that their eternity would change forever. Thank you, Jesus, for this time to come together, for this time to worship, and most especially. Father, we want to give you all glory, honor, and praise. Take all distractions away and let us worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen. So I want to talk tonight about our heart conditions. And I say our heart conditions because most of the time the preacher preaches to the preacher. I don't know if you know that or not, but... We, we stand up on these pulpits and these podiums and we bring messages. Most of the time they're delivered as strongly to us as they're ever delivered to you. Uh, it's, we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go on tonight. And as I talk about our heart condition, obviously I'm not talking about that muscle that's pumping blood through every one of us that are sitting here, standing here tonight. Hopefully you know that uh, in the Greek word, uh, the word heart is cardia. And it alludes to the, the seat of desires, of feelings, of affections, of passions, of impulses, all that we do. Basically, the heart of emotions, the seat of emotions. You know, we have an emotional God. Did you ever think about God being emotional? If you look at the word and, and you go through the words, you can find many emotions that God displays. He's a jealous God. Is that not an emotion? He can be a wrathful God. He is a God who takes pleasure in his children. So God is a God of emotion. You know, the Bible says that we were created in his image. Well, if we have emotion, then God has emotion. True? So as we deal with this tonight, I want to talk first of all about the heart of God. And I, I don't know that I understand God of the universe, and I don't know that I understand the depth of his emotions, because it's just really, as Moses says up here regularly, if he's a God I can figure out, then I need to find another God. Very true. You know, if I know what makes God tick, somebody's got a problem. I don't know all the answers, but I know there is only one mighty, powerful God, period. The heart of God is probably spoken as directly in one verse as any other in the Bible, and that's John 3, 16, which I think we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God manifests his love in many ways, but the first greatest thing he did for mankind was to send the only son, the only, the, the apple of his eye, the one he loves, the one that he absolutely planned for this to happen before the dawn of creation, and he sent him to earth, perfect, absolutely sinless, just as holy as you can possibly be, and what did we do with him? 
We crucified him. We beat him. Everything that was done to him should have been done to me because I am far from everything that Jesus is. So when we look at the heart of God, we look at love. That's, that is the most important thing. 1 John 4, 16 says God is love. He is the embodiment of love. He is the absolute manifestation of love. If you've ever thought anything, whatever your concept of love is, if it doesn't put God first, you've got a wrong concept. Whatever your concept is, because he is a very manifestation of, <coughs> of love in itself. And he manifests it in different ways. We all want to think of good old God. Graceful, merciful, loving, just good old God. Boy, you know, do, we, can do, we, we can do what we want to do because God's there and he's got us. Well, are we not his children? What's the Bible say about our children and how we should discipline and correct our children? I don't know if you know or not, but uh, there's a saying probably as old as the hills, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. Not what the Bible really says. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 24, that if you, if you do not discipline your child, you hate your child. Wow. It's pretty strong, isn't it? Guess what, guys? God's a better parent than you and me. And sometimes God manifests his love to us by disciplining us. Never very pleasant, always for a reason. A couple of things to know about God's discipline. It's always just, every time. And it's never done out of wrath. It's never done out of vindictiveness. It's done out of love to bring us where we need to come. Hebrews chapter 12. I hope you have a copy of God's Word. And if, uh, if you do, I hope you'll follow along with me as we look at various parts of God's Word. Because we're going to look at scriptures tonight. And by the way, anytime you come to this church, we're going to look at scriptures whether I'm up here or Moses is up here or whoever's up here. So I would hope that you have a copy of God's Word, and I hope you will open it. Hebrews chapter 12, and I don't know if page numbers are up there or not. But this is what God says about discipline. But if you be without chastisement or discipline, whereof all are partakers, in other words, everybody gets disciplined, then you are illegitimate, uh, the King James uses a different word, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection under the Father of spirits and live? Listen. When God is working on us, every one of us, he is going to show us direction. He is going to show us love. He is going to show us the attitude that we should have. He's going to show us everything we need to live a better life. And the only thing he asks is we are obedient. Every time we are obedient, we are blessed. So I would say to you tonight, bask in the love of God. Understand it is deep. It is emotional. It's what motivates him. You know, sometimes I look at the human race and I, I realize that God, why did he create us? Huh? Hey Amen. You, you know, it's not like he was floating around heaven all day going lonely, going, oh man, I wish I had somebody to talk to. No, he created us because he wanted children, us. And he created us with free will because you know what? He wants us to reciprocate that love to him freely. He could have made, it, made us like a bunch of little puppets. He could have hooked up the strings and said, okay, 
Now, I'm going, to marry, I'm going to move you to do whatever I want you to do. But instead, he gave us free will. And he said, you know what? I love you. I love you enough to give my son to pay for whatever sin that's in your life or ever going to be in your life. But I also want you to reciprocate that love to me. That's the heart of God. That's the heart of God. So what about people? What's the heart of people? My Marty, God bless her, I love her to pieces. <laughs> she looks for the good in people all the time. I've been at this long enough to be kind of cynical. I'm not that way so much. But look what God's word says, and I want you to understand, this is an Old Testament scripture we're going to. And sometimes you get people in modern day church and they go, well, that's Old Testament stuff. You know, that doesn't apply. Let me tell you. God gave us the entire book, not part of the book. He gave us the entire book and the teaching of the entire book to share, show with us what is right and what is wrong. So if it's in the Bible, God uses it. Amen. So, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is good for reproof. It's good for direction. It's good for us to, to learn. So I'm going to look at an Old Testament scripture. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10. If you're one of those people that look at the human race as always good, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. Wow. Wow. God has just said the heart of man is wicked. Not only comes from the Old Testament, but God in the flesh, being Jesus, in Matthew's Gospel, Chapter 15, I'm getting there, I'm like Moses, I love to hear pages turn. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, in verse 19, Jesus said, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts of murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. And in verse 20, he says, These are the things that defile a man. But then it goes on because he was teaching the Pharisees, but unwashed hands defileth not a man. Jesus has just said, if we have our heart's desire, most of the time it's going to be evil and wrong. Did you know that? Most of the time our heart's going to lead us astray. We'll start looking at things differently than we should. We will start seeing things that should not... Things we shouldn't go to will find appealing. The heart of, the heart of man. And, and you know, God knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows our hearts. He knows the depth of our hearts. He knows what we can come up with. Have you, uh, let me ask you this. Ever had thoughts you're ashamed of? Hmm? You don't, you don't have to confess or raise your hand or anything, but sure you have. You're human, right? I have. Have you ever had desires that were evil and you were ashamed of? Yeah. Yes, you have. Every one of us. See, God knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows what, what natural man is all about. I want, I want to tell you this. What do you do, believer? We're going to get to that word in a minute. What do you do, believer, when you're someplace and there is somebody who is using language that you just can't stand? I mean, they are dropping every word that you just cannot stand. Maybe they're wearing apparel that just absolutely goes against everything you believe. What do you do? How do you feel? Well, first of all, we ought to feel, I wonder if they know Jesus Christ as Savior. 
Because, see, if they don't know him as Savior, you know what they're doing? They're doing, they're acting naturally. Just exactly what they know to do, exactly how they are. They don't have a clue how to change it. Church, that's an indictment. That's an indictment to us. I heard a story years ago about a pastor whose name was Ike Riger, and I don't maybe you've heard of him or not, but he said he was at a restaurant at a church near a church that he was past, uh, was, he was going to come to preach. He was a guest speaker, and the pastor was a little short guy, a little short, bald-headed, no offense, Moses, <laughs> little, little short, bald-headed guy. And they're standing in line at this restaurant, and there's three construction workers ahead of them. And they listen to the conversation, and it is anything but pleasant, and it's anything but godly. So finally, the little pastor's had enough. Now, Dr. Riger's about six foot two or whatever. So the little guy walks up, and he picks the biggest construction worker, and he taps him on the shoulder. Boom, 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 boom. And the guy turns around, looks at him, and said, yes. And the, the uh, little pastor said, I just had a question. He says, well, what's the question? He said, you, do you eat out of that same filthy mouth you talk with? Dr. Riger said he was doing his very best Simon Peter impression. I don't know him. I've never known him. I have nothing to do with him. But the, the big old guy turned around, looked at the little pastor, and he said, you know, sir, I'm sorry if I offended you. I will try to watch my language around you from now on. You see, Christian, we can correct people without being hateful to them. We can correct people by just letting them know there's a better way. I want to think the pastor that did that was doing that to, to tell that you know, young man, there's a better way. You don't have to do this. But what we have, we have to get past being us and them. There is us and them. I agree with that 100%. But we have to get to the point where we are willing to deal with them just the way they are to get them to come to be a part of us. A lot of you may know we've been talking about it. Marty and I have embarked back into motorcycle ministry on a greater level. Doesn't mean we're leaving revolution, please. We're here. This is our church. We love this place. We want to be a part of it. But we also want to expand. We want to go out and, and, and reach people other places. Because as I stand up here and talk to you, and as Moses stands up here and talk to you, most of the time we're talking to saved individuals. We're talking to people that just need to be built up. But when we're out on the field, who knows who we're going to meet? And, and one of the greatest things that's happened in this church, and thank God for this church and this pastor, when we did this before, we never had a church that would undergird us, that would lift us up, that would be a part of the ministry. And we would witness to somebody at some event, and they would accept Christ as the Savior. And their very next question would be, well, where should I go to church? And I'd look at them like the deer in the headlight looks and think, I don't have a place to tell you. Because A, number one, most of them weren't very lovely. So when they walk in the door, they're not going to be one of God's little well-shorn sheep. God's going, they're going to look like the unruly goat. And they need a congregation that's going to say, hey, thank you. We're glad you're with us. We love you just like you are. We want to help you go where you need to go. Thank God for a church that's willing to do that. You guys, you know what? You, you clap for Moses. You, clap, you need to clap for yourself. You, are, you guys are great. You guys are great. Because they're coming. You'll see them. You'll see them. Love them when they get here. God, God, God's going to bring them. I can't help, can't help but believe God is going to bring them. So what happens when a person becomes a believer? You notice I didn't use the word Christian. And there's a reason. There are Christian everything out there. Do you know that? Christian t-shirt, Christian jewelry, Christian bumper stickers, Christian music, Christian, 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 Christian. It's pretty easy to put that label on. It really is. But sometimes that label doesn't mean what all it needs to mean. Did you know in the most correct texts that we can find. And I, I'm, 
If you know me, you know I, I use the King James Bible. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what Bible you, you need to use. This is dangerous, isn't it, Moses? I'm going to tell you what Bible you need to use. You need to use the one that you will open and you will read and you will follow its teaching. I don't care what version it is. If, you, if you'll open it and use it, read it. But in the most original text we can find, the word Christian is used how many times? Three. Some of the, and I'm going to, I'm going to use this term lightly, don't stone me. Some of the more watered down texts, you can find it five times. There's a couple of them you can find it seven. But in the most original text, it's used three times. And you know what's interesting? Two of those three times it's used with a negative connotation. It was actually a word that was used to describe the lowest of the low. It wasn't building people up. It was tearing people down when that word was used. And I'm going to give you the three scriptures. You can write them down if you want to. But it, the word Christian is used uh, in 1 Peter 4.16. And that's pretty much the most positive you'll find. And in Acts chapter 11 verse 26. And Acts chapter 26 verse 28. But I want to go to 1 Peter 4.16 for just a minute. Because, boy, you're, you know what? We talked about demonstrative and emotive worship the other day at our Wednesday night service. And I am definitely not the most demonstrative person in the world. You, you can understand. I hope you understand that. But 1 Peter 4.16 is the one of the times the word Christian is used, and it's the most positive time I could find. 1 Peter 4.16, Yet if a man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. You don't hear that too often when people are talking to you about accepting Christ as a Savior. You're going to get the chance to suffer with Him. Amen? Boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? How many of you, when somebody was sharing Jesus Christ with you, wouldn't have come up to you and said, You know what, I want to share Christ with you. I would love to see you accept Him as your Savior he died for your sins. He paid for you a, a horrible death on a cross so you could have eternal life. Wouldn't you enjoy suffering with him? We wouldn't get many takers, I'm afraid. And too many times we in the church have laid that out that way. We've said, oh, it's all pie in the sky. It's all wonderful. And let me tell you, it's all wonderful. God's got it. He's got everything under control. I don't care how impossible it looks. God's got it under control. God can handle it. So, it is a glorious, wonderful, fruitful life, but it's not always an easy life. As a matter of fact, we're promised that we'll have troubles and tribulations in this world. But Jesus has overcome the world. Hey, Amen. Boy, you're a quiet bunch tonight. I know what you mean, Moses. We're going we're gonna to have to jumpstart you guys somewhere and get you going here. Be, amen. Be happy that Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. Amen. So what happens in the believer? Somebody has been involved in that natural life we've been talking about. They've been doing what they do, going through life. And somehow the gospel gets shared with them. Excuse me. Somehow they come to know Christ as Savior. Romans 10, 9 and 10, which is the combination of the Romans Road. If you all have ever heard of the Romans Road to Salvation, it's been used by people forever. Romans 3, 23, Romans 5, 8, Romans 6, 23, and then finally it ends in Romans 10, 9 and 10. So what happens in that heart? That it shall, thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For years and years and years, I was a Southern Baptist pastor. And it is, you can pretty well tell the way that church works. For years and years and years, we gave altar calls. And I told Moses earlier tonight that if you give an altar call and play the music long enough, somebody will come forward. 
if for nothing else than to shut the service off. <laughs> but it is important, guys, when you come to know Christ as Savior, that you tell somebody about it. Because it's just said here, as you believe in your heart, you believe under righteousness. You have a heart transplant. Things change. Things change because you have a heart that's changed. And so as you believe in that, <clears throat> and then the confession is made unto salvation. One of the greatest confessions we see in this church unto salvation is that tub gets used. The floor gets wet. Love wet floors. Mm -hmm. Don't we, Moses? Oh, my this is one of the few churches in the world I've been in that there have been impromptu baptisms. Hmm. Most of the time, it's announced three weeks ahead of time or three months ahead of time. We're going to have baptism at such and such a time. They've been through the classes. We've had them into their salvation classes, and we've had them into their pastor's classes, and we've taught them what they need to know to get baptized, and now we think they're all ready to get baptized. Where in God's Word does it say that? What does it say? Believe. And I believe is the key heart crux of it. Let me tell you, you can be baptized a hundred times and be lost. But you can't be lost and be baptized. So, if you've ever come to the point where Jesus Christ has become your Savior, and you've never told anybody, tell somebody. And if you've ever come to the point where Jesus Christ is your Savior, and you've never been baptized, get baptized. It's usually the first act of obedience for those who finally believe. Amen. Amen. The heart changes, guys. The heart changes. Let me give you another scripture. Ephesians 5.19. This is what happens to your heart when it gets changed. Kind of interesting, as Paul was writing to the Ephesians, the way he used some of the language he uses. I'm actually going to back up to verse 18, chapter 5 of Ephesians 18. Paul says, and, and be not drunk with wine. I wonder why he started out there. Wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. In verse 19, here's, here's how the heart, the ones with changed heart acts, acts. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our language changes, our life experience change, we do things differently than we used to do, we praise God, we praise God. We get to, one of the things we've been teaching in this church a lot in the last little bit is when you sing, okay, and I don't sing much, and Marty's very thankful that I don't sing much. You need to be thankful that I don't sing much. <laughs> But when we sing, why do we sing? What's the motivation? Are we sing? Praise, praise the Lord. Okay, I'm, I'm always thought. But are we singing about God or to God? See, even as bad as my voice is, if I sing to God, He likes it. Well, He's patient. <laughs> yes, He is. He is patient. So. You know, I don't know where you are. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you're pretty reserved. Maybe you don't. Uh, I, I started to say this, but I better not because you never can tell what the Holy Spirit's going to do, so I'll go ahead and say it because now the Holy Spirit knows I've confessed to him. But if you see me dancing across the floor, you better figure out that something happened. On, yeah. I, I got bit by a bug bad or something happened for me to go <laughs> dancing across the floor. But we do need within the scope of who we are. And listen. Never fake it. Never fake it. Let the Holy Spirit move you. And when he does, 
do what he tells you to do. Whatever that is. Because if you're doing what he, he tells you to do, who am I, who is Moses, who is anybody to say you can't? As long as the Holy Spirit's leading you guys, amen. God bless you. God bless. It's never a show. It's always to honor God. Always to honor God. So we talked a lot about hearts, hearts of God, hearts of individuals, hearts of the believer. I want to take a look for just a moment about the heart of Christ. And I'm still in Ephesians, chapter 1, and I'm going to start at verse 20. Ephesians 1, 20. I've been accused of getting there because I know where I'm going and not giving you guys time to get there, so I'll try to give you time to get there for just a moment. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20, talking about, basically he's talking about the church, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Did you know, and I, I wrote this in my notes, and I don't, hopefully I can make sense of it or help you make sense of it. Local churches, we ought to be miniatures of Christ. That's who we ought to be. We ought to be models of Christ. What, what he's just said here that Christ is the head of the church. He's all-powerful. He's the head of everything that you can think of, be a part of, everything of this world and the world to come. He's in his, at God's right hand, but he is the head of the church, and he is the fullness of God magnified to us and manifest to us in the flesh. And if we're going to be the church of Christ, and that's not saying we're non-denominational, we're not affiliated with it. But actually the whole deal is we should be the church that is Christ to the world. That's who we need to be. Our hearts need to be that set up, that we serve he who is all-powerful. Think about that. We serve he who is all-powerful. He's done things that you and I can't even imagine. I guess we can imagine them, but we just don't know how we would ever accomplish them. He walked on the water. Anybody here walked across Lake Eustace lately? I don't think so. He turned the, he turned the water into wine. I always love that story because, you know, because because I look at little nuances in the Bible, things that don't, don't make a bit of difference. Don't, Moses talked about the other day about Jesus when the woman was brought to him in adultery and he got down and he wrote, in, wrote in, the, in the dirt with his finger. What did he write? I don't know. Doesn't make any difference really. It's just God put it in his word. When did the water turn to wine? I don't know. All we know is it had a bunch of barrels filled up with water and told the servants, Dip the, dip the uh, pitcher in the water and take it to the master of the, of the uh, feast. And when he got to the master of the feast, the master of the feast said, man, that's the best wine I've ever tasted. When did it turn? I don't know. I really don't care. All I know is Jesus did that miracle. Praise God. If we want to see miracles done in the church, all we have to do is say, Lord, where do you want us to go? And let us be obedient enough to start out. In our Bible study in John, we've been talking about the man who had his sight restored, Jesus. Weird, man. Weird stuff. He spit in the clay, spit in the dirt, made clay, wiped it in the man's eyes, and said, go wash. Really? I mean, all Jesus had to do was say, be, be healed and he'd be able to see. Je he goes down the road. He starts down the road. Okay, Jesus said go wash. I'll go wash. He's going to go wash. When did his sight return? I don't know because it just says, the man said, I washed and when I opened my eyes I could see. 
you know, those things we don't have to worry about. What we have to worry about is doing what Christ says. Because if we do what Christ says, the church will flourish, people will get saved, and we will be a light that is just absolutely blinding. And people will have to say, something's happening, and we need to go see what it's all about. That's what we need to do, guys. That's the time to be excited. Yeah. Be excited at the worship services, at the, at the singing services, absolutely. But be excited when you walk out of these doors. Yes. And be excited when you meet people. And be excited when you meet somebody who says, I don't understand all this Jesus stuff. And be real honest. Tell them, you know what, I'm not sure I understand it all, but it works. Yeah. It works. Uh -huh. And maybe if you'll just step up by faith and say, Lord, I don't know how to do this, but I do know that if I accept what you said and your word has just said, if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth, I'll be saved. And guess what? Your life will change. Change 180 degrees. People say, well, I don't know how to witness. Sure you do. Are you saved? I mean, I hope everybody in here is saved. So all your, just here's how you witness. And you don't have to have a Bible. Hey, I'm so-and-so. I used to be this way. I did all this stuff. It was wrong. And I'm not proud that I did it. I'm not bragging. But I had an encounter with Jesus Christ. He came into my life. It was personal. And I'm changed. And now I do this stuff. I don't do that anymore. I do. That's the only thing you have to know to share Christ with somebody that he is God and he can change whatever's wrong in our lives, every one of us. I pray you're there tonight. I pray you're there tonight. So Moses started out with me, I'm going to end up with him. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I want to talk about the heart of the pastor. And we talked about, I, I, told, I talked about Old Testament scriptures earlier. And I want to give you a couple of Old Testament scriptures, a little background to go along with. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. God is talking to Jeremiah, and he is talking about the unfaithfulness of the nation Israel, but what he is telling Jeremiah to tell them, and others, I suppose, here, because in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15, it says, And I will give you pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. See, God's just told Jeremiah, I'm going to put my heart in your heart so you can help these people go where they need to go. Let me tell you what. That is an awesome, awesome, awesome responsibility. And, of course, Jeremiah had it very easy. Uh, his life was just simple and easy and perfect, and pa just like all pastors, you know. Pastors have the easiest life in the world. Yeah, right. If you believe that, you've never been one or very close to one. Because if you go over a few chapters in Jeremiah, chapter 17, and I'm looking at verse 16. I kind of have to dissect this a little bit because Jeremiah is pleading with God here. He's, there's been a, a tremendous bunch of sin in the nation Israel. And Jeremiah says to God, As for me, I have not hastened or done away from being a pastor to follow thee, follow God. Neither have I desired the woeful days that thou knowest which came out of my lips. So Jeremiah had to, had to preach what God told him to preach. And, and it's, it ends with, was right before thee. So Jeremiah has said that you've called me to be a pastor, a preacher, a teacher to these people, and it hasn't been easy, but I haven't run from the responsibility. Wow. That is so awesome when you stop and look at it. Because I want you to know this. It's not easy to get called to the pastorate. It's much easier to run from it. And I will tell you, it's important that we help the pastor's heart be what it needs to be. 
Back to the New Testament. I'll give you a minute to get there. Ephesians chapter 4, which actually talks about God and his call on people's lives. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and some teachers. So he gave various gifts to the leaders who would come as servants in the church. And look what he gave them for. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So what does the pastor do when he gets up here every week? He's working on your perfection. Did you know that? He's working on your perfection. And you know, I, I think Moses will agree with me about it. It's very hard for imperfect men to work on making you perfect or helping you to be perfect. That's what we're called to do. He's working on equipping you for the work of the ministry. You know ministries work? Absolutely. I firmly believe that the work of your ministry, I'm trying to make eye contact with everybody in here right now, that the work of your ministry, that means you have a ministry. I firmly believe that the work of your ministry, you need to do. Because God's called you to do something. I promise you God's called you to do something. If God hasn't called you to do something, you need to check on your heart condition. And he's called us to teach, edifying the body of Christ. That's us, guys. That's us. A couple more New Testament scriptures as we wind down. And this is, you can look at these as I share with you and say, well, he's quit preaching and going to meddling. Because that may be true. Hebrews 13, 7. And this is where the pastor gets really hard. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversion. So, if I'm going to speak unto you the word of God, my faith needs to be Showing Christ in me. That's the important thing. We have to be, we who have been called to preach the gospel, and I know exactly how, I don't know if I know exactly how, but I can relate to what Paul said about woe be unto me if I do not preach. It's a calling. It's something we have to do. People used to ask me when I was, before I retired, if I ever thought about quitting while I was young in the ministry, just every Monday morning, just every Monday morning, pastor, it is a great responsibility, a heavy responsibility. I want you to look at Hebrews 13, 17. If you haven't looked at anything else this evening, look at it. Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprof unprofitable for you. The heart of the pastor. The heart of the pastor is one that wants to lead you correctly. That's why it says obey and submit. The heart of the pastor is to watch over our souls, to help us understand, to help us have a better relationship with Jesus Christ, to help us grow, to help our souls become stronger as we serve the Lord. Have I put enough responsibility on you yet, Moses? But you know what? It comes back around. It says, too, also that we're going to give an account. We who have been called into the pastor are going to give an account. There's going to come a time we're going to stand before Jesus Christ and he's going to say, what did you do with my flock? See, the pastor is actually just a spiritual guide 
of a particular church and he cares for those entrusted to him. That's what the pastor is. If you want a definition of a pastor, there it is. A spiritual guide of a particular church who cares for the flock entrusted to him. But you know what? It's not a one-way street, flock. Listen. That they may do it with joy. We ought to be making our pastor's job joyful. You know that? Really. It says here, and not with grief. So I don't want to be bringing grief to our pastor. I want to be bringing joy to our pastor. And you know what also it goes up and finishes up? If we don't do that, it says, for that is unprofitable for you. Hmm. So if you want to be profitable in the Lord, support, help, and be a really undergirding to the pastor. If you don't want to be profitable for the Lord, go out to after Sunday or Saturday night or whenever, go out to church and have the pastor for dinner or lunch. Happens too many times in churches. Pastors are devoured. Pastors' families are devoured. Every called pastor, and I use the word called because there are a few out there that do it as a vocation, but every called pastor has that heart who wants to help your soul, who knows you're a flock that's entrusted to him, and he wants to do what God has called him to do in his life that he may help you live a better life. I honestly feel that we have a pastor that does that to the very best of his ability. And I think when he, fails, when he finds it maybe not the best of his ability, he feels convicted about it, and he works on being better. We love you, Moses, and I appreciate you, brother. We're going to close here in just a moment. I always have a word of prayer. We will take a, we'll, we'll worship by giving. You know, that's an act, a tremendous act of worship is to being able to give. That is honestly, ought to be one of your favorite times of the service is the fact that two things ought to happen in a Christian's life. I went to that word again, believer's life. I get to go to church. When I was a kid growing up, I got taken to church. Other times, I felt like I have to go to church. There's a reason. Something's got to be done. I have to go to church. You know what? That whole concept needs to change. We need to get up and go, I get to go to church. Thank you, Jesus. I get to go to church. I, you know, I, I, I can get excited about that. Thank you, Jesus. I get to go to church. And then you know what's better than that? Jesus, I get to go to church and I get to give. Thank you, Lord. Because every good and perfect gift comes from him. You have anything to be thankful for? It's because of God. You have anything in your life that is good? It's because of God. If your heart's right tonight, it's because of God. Pray with me, please. Father God, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to bring your word, Lord. Thank you for the conviction that I have felt this week as I studied this word. And Lord, I do believe that our pastor lives with that conviction every week. I pray, Lord, you would just bless him and his family beyond measure as they strive to serve you in every aspect. I pray, Lord, for this congregation. I pray that we will fall in love with each other. We will have a broken heart for those that are lost. And Lord, we'll go every time we go from the service we will go saying it's truly been good to be in the house of the Lord it was fantastic Lord that we got to come and worship you Lord it was fantastic that we got to sing that we were able to give and Lord I ask as we give here in a few moments as these men come to take the offering men and ladies come to take the offering that you give as God lays on your heart whatever that may be God may lay on your heart to give sacrificially and you, you may need to give more than you really planned on. But if God tells you to do that, do that. He'll bless it. If God tells you to withhold, withhold. There's a reason. He's telling you to do that. 
Whatever God is prompting you to do through the Holy Spirit, you do at this time of worship as we are able to give back the gifts that come so freely from our Lord. We ask you, Lord, that you would bless this offering and bless the giver as well as those that can't give. And Lord, just we ask that you would use everything we do in this congregation to bless, honor, and glorify you at all times. We love you, Jesus. It's in your holy and precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen.